Welcome to the National Wraparound Initiative, TA Network, uh, webinar implementing <laughs> based practice within wraparound and systems of care. Uh, I'm John Osowski, and I am the project manager for the National Wraparound Initiative. And before we begin, I'd like to just go over a couple of housekeeping things with you. Uh, we recommend that you close all file sharing applications, including streaming music or video. Uh, please check the settings in your audio pane if you are experiencing audio problems. During the presentation, you can send questions to the webinar organizer, but these will be held to the end. So please just chat your questions into us uh, using the questions interface, and we will try our best to get to them at the end. Uh, and always, as always, please remember the webinar and PowerPoint will be available on the NWI website, and the URL is listed below. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our host, Eric Bruns. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody who is participating in this uh, most recent webinar uh, hosted by the National Wraparound Initiative. We are pleased to co-present this webinar um, with the TA Network, National TA Network for Children's Behavioral Health. Uh, this is also part of their uh, clinical track uh, that is uh, part and parcel of the National TA Network. Uh, the National Wraparound Initiative is proud to be a core partner in the National TA Network. Um, today we're going to be talking about something that is near and dear to uh, the hearts of our presenters, and I'm sure many of you out there, which is how best to provide help to uh, children, youth, and families um, that have been, uh, that are best, most likely to be uh, effective. Um, what are the uh, services and supports that we can provide within systems of care that have the greatest likelihood of effectively meeting the needs of uh, our youth and families? And specifically, what we're going to be talking about today is how can we leverage the complementary strengths of the system of care philosophy and organizing structures with all of the research that has been generated over the last uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 years about what kinds of clinical practices are effective at meeting uh, the, the needs of children and youth with uh, behavioral health disorders. Um, so as we know, uh, systems of care uh, propose a number of routes to more positive outcomes for children and youth, uh, including that we have systems that are capable of being family-driven and youth-guided, that services will be individualized and well-coordinated, uh, that services will be culturally competent. Systems of care also demands that there uh, is in existence in any system a comprehensive service array uh, that includes uh, access to supports uh, for, for children and their families, such as uh, uh, respite, mentoring, family support. Um, when family needs reach uh, a level of uh, intensiveness, wraparound care coordination uh, also should be available for those families uh, and youth with the most complex needs. But one thing that uh, is really important to recognize is that systems of care also dictate that evidence-based clinical services are available within the service array. Um, however, a lot of folks have observed that historically there's not been uh, a whole lot of uh, great success in coordinating uh, wraparound and systems of care with evidence-based practices. Um, and we'll discuss uh, uh, some of the reasons for that uh, lack of historical coordination um, across these different schools of thought. But primarily what we want to talk about today in this webinar is uh, review um, the great success and progress that's been made in this area of leveraging the complementary strengths of systems of care wraparound and evidence-based practice. Um, there have been extraordinary examples that have been generated in ways in which these uh, different philosophies and the different research bases for uh, systems of care wraparound and evidence-based practice have come together in systems across the country. And uh, so to that end, today we are presenting a webinar entitled Implementing Evidence-Based Practice Within Wraparound and Systems of Care. And uh, again, I'm Eric Bruns at the University of Washington and a co-director of the National Wraparound Initiative. I'm joined today by Rosalind Bertram from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, um, and Suzanne Kearns, my colleague at the University of Washington. Um, and both Sue, Sue and Rosalind are also part of a uh, national consortium called the Child and Family Evidence-Based Practice Consortium. 
Uh, finally, uh, we're joined by Tegan Henke, uh, who is a state development specialist for the Texas Systems of Care uh, Institute for Excellence in Mental Health at the University of Texas. Um, so what we're going to do today, John, if you could advance the slide, is uh, we're going to start by uh, having a quick review of evidence-based practices, um, followed by, and that will be uh, presented by Rosalind and Sue. Um, the webinar will then come back to me, and I will talk about the role of evidence-based practices in systems of care and wraparound, and some options for how to best coordinate evidence-based practice with wraparound for youth with the most complex needs. And we'll then uh, see some examples from the field, starting with Rosalind, uh, who will be talking about, uh, well, I'll be presenting some examples from the field uh, regarding wraparound and modularized EBP and integrating evidence-based practices into wraparound practice. Rosalind will provide some examples from her work in, uh, in Houston, Texas. And finally, we will listen uh, to Tegan as she describes the way in which the state of Texas has attempted to integrate both wraparound and systems, I'm sorry, and evidence-based practices into their service array that's available to children and families in, in Texas. Go ahead to the next slide, John. Uh, before I hand it over to Rosalind to talk really quickly about the uh, evidence-based practice consortium, here's just the main points uh, that you should be listening for. First of all, it is critical that we use effective strategies in children's behavioral health, such as evidence-based practices. Um, and although there have been challenges in, in coordinating EBPs with systems of care, uh, we need to recognize that the EBP movement has really evolved and matured over the last decade. There are many more evidence-based practices that have the capacity to meet many more uh, child and family needs, and they work better in the real world than ever. So although there are challenges, um, our take is, is that um, with some real systematic thinking and uh, system design, evidence-based practices can be thoughtfully integrated into family and youth-driven individualized systems of care. And we'll be talking about some of those options today. So with that, I'll hand it back to John and to Rosalind Bertram to talk a little bit about the Evidence-Based Practice Consortium. Thanks, Eric. Next slide, John. Uh, I'm Rosalind Bertram. I'm co-director of the Child and Family Evidence-Based Practice Consortium which is both nationally and internationally represented, New Zealand, Canada, Europe, and throughout the United States. We were formed in 2004. Eric was actually part of the group that got that going at the uh, Tampa conference, I believe. Um, we established multiple forums for research, training, technical assistance, and networking, uh, trying to expand dissemination and use of evidence-based practice and implementation science and frameworks uh, you can see some of this work and work with us. We encourage you to do so at the website on this slide. Next slide, John. The um, actual uh, website address will soon become simply ebpconsortium.com. We're in the process of transforming the website. Uh, there you'll be able to find a number of uh, studies, articles, examples, archived webinars, some of which are noted here. Um, you can get onto the mailing list for notification about the webinars. Our next one is, I believe, February 23rd with Kimberly Hogwood uh, presenting evidence-based practice in children's mental health and child welfare. Next slide, please. And just as a humorous note to answer the question, why implement a proven practice? For the very simple example of Big Bird here, uh, youth and families should be able to expect uh, evidence-informed behavioral health services in the same way that when they go to a medical doctor, they expect proven practices. And then I'll hand it over to Sue. Sue? Thanks, Rosalind. And hello, everyone. Uh, we can advance it to the next slide, please. Here we go. Okay, so, you know, starting with the end in mind, and as you all know, the whole point of doing effective practices is to improve the lives of children, youth, and families, and to help them build upon their strengths and skillfully face challenges. And we know that proven effective practices offer approaches that often work in as short as 10 to 20 weeks long. There have been several studies that have documented cost savings of doing such practices uh, compared with business as usual. And here I would really refer listeners to the Washington State Institute of 
for Public Policy. If you're interested in looking at some internationally recognized work that documents lifetime cost savings that can be associated with using such practices. Um, and what you may find interesting about this website as well is that they look at um, look at services that are delivered not just within mental health, but also juvenile justice, child welfare, substance use, and education. And also they've done some work in prevention programs too. The important thing is that with proven practices, you know what you're getting. And so this can be really appealing to stakeholders and government officials who are trying to decide how to expend their precious dollars. And it provides a level of accountability that's common in other areas, such as business and medicine, but maybe we don't see quite as often in mental health. And finally, implementing proven practices is well aligned with the ACA because of the emphasis of matching programs with specific client needs. Can we go to the next slide. So a number of fields, though, are not fully comfortable with what is the nature of evidence-based practice. It's not just, um, doesn't just belong to one discipline or one field. This question is being asked across the country. Roslyn, myself, and colleagues have been collecting information from schools and universities, and others have been gathering perspectives from the field. And combined with different discussions in the literature, we've come up with a highlights list of some of the most common thoughts or beliefs about proven practices that we hear from different groups that we think might, uh, might uh, that we think are misconceptions. And we'd like to have this opportunity with you all today to clarify some of those. It should be stated up front, though, that um, we all know that interventions or a particular intervention or even suite of interventions is not a panacea. We're not going to solve every problem or address every need uh, with these interventions, but they do provide um, an opportunity to uh, dispel some of the misconceptions that do hamper willingness to embrace or use some of these proven practices when they are available. We think that for the percentages of of children, families, and youth that these are appropriate for, but it's probably the best show in town. And so I want to talk through how, um, how we can think about the, some of the misconceptions that are out there. So look, if we could go to the next slide. What I'm going to do now is just run through, run through some of these. Um, the first one is that evidence-based practices or proven practices are cookbooks. And um, that you present, you know, you address complex issues in the same way every time, um, and that that can be a concern. So one of my favorite, I do a lot of training in, in different evidence-based interventions and train a lot of, uh, of practitioners, and so I, um, I see this in almost every training that I do because it comes up. It's, there's always a space where art meets science. It's true. We bring our most creative selves to the work we do, it's probably a large reason why many of us went into this field in the first place, and that doesn't disappear when we're delivering proven practices. Most interventions train their providers in the principles of the intervention. There's fidelity, of course, in how you deliver it, but there's also flexibility. Fidelity we think about as the active ingredients are those pieces that we know have to be there to produce that change, and we don't mess with those. But all around the edges is flexibility. For example, if you have a client who cannot read, but the intervention comes with a workbook that's part of the intervention, it doesn't make sense to rely on the workbook. Instead, a provider would use clinical skills and creativity to perhaps provide extra practice opportunities in session, so it may be slowing down the delivery of the intervention to ensure that there's that additional time, consider having a support person attend along with the, with the child or family or, or um, youth, or even audio record session or reminders. I'm sure many of you on this webinar have other examples to fill in there about how you've been able to, to creatively address situations with families. Next slide. For this misconception, EBPs don't account for or engage in practitioner expertise. I'm going to borrow a phrase from my colleague Sherry Shapiro who says, this manual actually comes with a brain. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> and she's, she's, I've heard her say that in, in trainings before, and I really like that because it's thinking about this, you know, um, there's a way to, you know, really honor our knowledge as therapists or as a practitioners um, in the how. So, I mean, taking an example of teaching a child to read, there's a standard approach. Almost every kindergarten, you know, you kind of need to first learn 
you know, the letters and the sounds that are associated with the letters and how the letters go together to make words. But there's lots of different ways you can go about that step. So to learn the letters, some classroom teachers might have children trace the letter A over and over again. Another classroom, the teacher has the children making A's with their bodies and doing a dance. In another classroom, a teacher goes for a walk and has, sees if the children can spot A's around the neighborhood. The point is the same, right? They're all learning about A, but the method to doing it, the teachers are being creative around. And similar with treatments. So depending on the, the needs of the child and family, there's lots of flexibility about how different skills are presented and taught. So a good example here is relaxation training and cognitive behavioral therapy. A therapist could use guided imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, or body awareness meditations, depending on client preference, therapist expertise. The therapist could guide the relaxation themselves. They could use an audio tape or an online tool. The important point is that the client experiences relaxation in the body. How they get there, there's a lot of flexibility around that, and the practitioner can really engage their expertise and partner with the child or family on how to get there. Okay, next slide. The next, um, and this is actually a good segue into this one, the next uh, misconception is that evidence-based practices uh, ignore client values and preferences. Most evidence-based practices have a strategy to engage families and partners in treatment. And here I'd like to um, cite an example from the Triple P Positive Parenting Program. In this intervention, the practitioner uses an approach called the Guided Participation Model. In this model, the practitioner ensures that both the family and the provider have a shared understanding, I call the three shares, the shared understanding of the nature of the concerns, a shared understanding of their causes, not blaming the parents, and a shared understanding about what to do about it. And then, when conducting the intervention, practitioners are coached to regularly and often check in with families about how they see the strategy, if they think it's going to work for them, and have direct discussions about options and alternatives. In fact, in the example of Triple P, practitioners usually work with families only on a few key skills, but there's actually 17 different skills that the practitioners know that can be used within the intervention. So it's the practitioner's job to partner with the family and determine which ones are aligned with the family's beliefs about what will work and what they see is doable within their family environment. So the whole intervention is set up to kind of activate and be responsive to, from the very beginning, those client values and preferences and have that be addressed within partnership, um, with, with partnership between the practitioner and, and the family. Next slide, please. Thank you. This next misconception is that EBPs don't take into account issues of client diversity. And that there's been a lot of discussion about this point over the past decade. Because of the bountiful diversity in our country, it's impossible for any program to specifically articulate exactly how the program could or should be adapted, or any accommodations that could or should be made for different cultural, ethnic, sexual orientation, religious, or other differences. This harkens back to my earlier points around flexibility with infidelity and bringing your brain to the game. Increasingly, evidence-based practices are being evaluated with diverse populations. They're reliably being found to have similar levels of effectiveness as earlier trials, where maybe um, inclusion of diverse samples was not as prioritized. Culturally adapted interventions are also being developed. And a great example of this that I'd just like to highlight for a moment is Stephanie Cord's work on um, where she's developed a program called the Black Parenting Strengths and Strategies Program. And what why I highlight this is she took an established evidence-based practice called Parenting the strong Willed Child by Rex Forehand and Bob McMahon, and she enhanced it with material specific to the sociocultural realities of African-American families. So she characterized it really as adding a racial socialization component, and it includes providing more specific information to parents about the social-emotional development in African-American children strategies for increasing self-confidence at school and developing a positive self-image in African-American children, promoting positive and developmentally appropriate parent and child discussions about racial issues, and enhancing children's problem-solving skills. 
So in this way, she took a, a program that the base of it was really effective for many, many families, but embedded a real component that um, is designed to support African American parents to foster social, cultural, and emotional health on their children. So there is this work that's being done, um, and I just wanted to highlight that as an example. Okay, next slide. The next misconception is that EDPs disregard the importance of the therapeutic alliance. And for here, I think a good example is to highlight dialectical behavior therapy. This intervention is very helpful for adolescents who have a history of suicidal attempts, ideation, cutting, or who have a very difficult time regulating their emotions. In this treatment, there actually is a 10-step process that's outlined in the manual to enhance the therapeutic alliance. It includes actively using microcounseling skills to, at the same time, be friendly, egalitarian, and down-to-earth and open and also earning respect and conveying credibility, which we know can be difficult with adolescents. I won't go into all the details of this approach due to time, but the other piece of this intervention is that the team and the therapist is considered to be the ones responsible for engagement. So a DBT team would never allow a therapist to be making attributions like the adolescent is unmotivated or difficult to engage. The team would hold the therapist accountable for identifying strategies to gain movement and commitment from the adolescent. So this is a huge emphasis in, in that treatment, and I think it's such as the case for other practices as well. Next slide. The next, um, this is actually a really important uh, idea that there's a big research to practice gap. And it's an area that has received a lot of attention in the past decade. Not that there isn't still a way to go, ways to go, but we now have implementation frameworks and approaches that have been helpful to agencies and jurisdictions when implementing these practices. Part of the issue um, has been that historically when practices have moved from the you know, efficacy or even effectiveness trials out to broader dissemination into the communities, outcomes seem to reduce. However, with the focus on fidelity the positive out and implementation, the positive outcomes have been found um, to be possible in a larger scale. So here I refer you all to the, a study of multisystemic therapy that was conducted by Sonia Schoenwald and colleagues. Um, it was published in 2003 in the journal Mental Health Services Research. And they call, they call this the MST Transportability Study. In this large multi-site study, she was able to examine the implementation factors that were associated with outcomes and really found therapist adherence, organizational climate and structure at baseline had the biggest impact on child outcomes. And so MST developed a really robust strategy for supporting therapists in delivering the service, regular fidelity monitoring with feedback, strong organizational supports during implementation. So there's a lot more technology out there that supports um, getting across this precarious bridge that you see in the slide. Okay, I think our final misconception that we have here um, is that EDPs are cost-cutting tools that are promoted by insurance companies. Um, one way to think about EDPs is as a win-win, better outcomes in shorter time, and thus the savings on costs. However, there is an underlying concern that by limiting costs, that the result is a restriction in service access. Um, we think, though, that because of the efficiencies in the use of EVPs, it actually has the potential to increase access, as there will presumably be shorter waiting lists and fewer needs for repeated therapy episodes. There's no doubt that high-quality implementation of evidence-based practices creates efficiencies. So I will just, if we go to the next slide, um, have a couple just transitional thoughts. Um, one is that your child and family team may either use models within your team or may look outside to outside community supports to provide the services. Uh, you'll hear some examples later in the webinar about how evidence-based practices are brought to bear within each of these models. However, regardless of the model, there are a couple final points I want to just touch on, and then you'll hear more in-depth later on in this webinar. Next slide. The first point is that implementation matters. There are many anecdotal stories about providers who say they're doing some name brand program or approach, but when the family describes the treatment, it sounds nothing like 
what it should sound like. And so there is a lot of variation out there. And a lot of the time, this is attributable to varying levels of implementation supports. So here I just uh, reference uh, the NERN implementation drivers. There's a reference down at the bottom. And, um, and I, I believe you're going to be getting some additional information about implementation later today. But it is worth spending some time thinking about how these drivers may be impacting uh, your group or the community, the broader community. And finally, if you could go to this fun, oh, actually, could you just kind of advance all the animation for this one? Sorry. Thank you. Woo, there we go. <laughs> um, we're going to talk more about this, and I'm, and actually in the interest of time, I'm going to defer to having Rosalind unpack this a little more when she talks about the wraparound initiative in Houston. But this is basically a picture of how implementation supports can create a, um, an infrastructure to really ensure high quality uh, implementation. So with that, I'll conclude. And I believe I'm turning it over to, back to Eric at this point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sue. Um, and just a process check, um, feel free to enter questions into the, uh, the, the chat box that you have on your GoToMeeting uh, panel. Um, and we will get to questions and answers right about uh, 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern um, at the end of our didactic portion of this webinar. Um, we've already gotten a couple that we're going to certainly respond to. So my job now for the next 10 minutes is just to talk a little bit about ways in which to actually integrate with specific evidence-based practices uh, for uh, common behavioral health disorders in childhood actively into systems of care and wraparound. As Sue described, we're learning more and more every day how to de develop and adapt um, evidence-based practices to be more aligned with youth and family preferences and needs. Go to the next slide there, John. And how to be culturally competent, how to uh, respect and reflect the diversity in our uh, clinical workforce. But there obviously are some surface uh, differences between orientations to evidence-based practice and systems of care. Evidence-based practices, um, you know, as a hallmark of evidence-based practices, they are often focused on addressing a specific uh, symptom or problem. That's how they, uh, the researchers or developers often successfully develop an evidence-based practice is to have a clear treatment target, such as uh, some of the ones that we have the best evidence for. Uh, treatments for depression, uh, childhood anxiety, uh, behavioral disorders, um, attention deficit disorders, um, negative effects of trauma. These are areas in which we have very good evidence for things that work that we need to train up our clinicians to be able to deliver in systems of care. But at the same time, uh, being trained on how to deliver an evidence-based practice for a specific problem um, can run against the system of care philosophy, which is to have comprehensive plans that have multiple components because children and youth often have complex needs and not just a single uh, clinical problem. So evidence-based practices may be focused on a single problem or, um, or need. Um, as we've already heard, they do tend to be uh, uh, very well defined and manualized, although flexibility is often uh, built into them. Um, skill focused, sometimes practitioner directed and time limited, whereas systems of care and wraparound are by intention uh, intended to be family and youth directed, individualized, um, and uh, be around providing supports until needs are met rather than being a, a certain number of sessions. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, John. So there's uh, on the surface a little bit of a question about the incommensurability of the two philosophies. So barriers to integration that we have seen out there, we can't pretend that they don't exist despite all the progress that we've made and the fact that a lot of uh, the concerns about evidence-based practices are misconceptions. There are true barriers to integration. As I said already, um, a single specific EBP may not uh, meet the need of uh, any particular youth. Um, even if it is likely to meet one need, uh, sometimes youth and families have an array of needs that need to be met. Uh, a youth may not be eligible for any of the EBPs that are available in a system. Um, specification that is inherent to certain EVPs may leave uh, little room for family choice or voice. Um, 
we had a question from the audience about specifically addressing the uh, multi-systemic therapy, which is a uh, EBP that was developed out of uh, juvenile justice to meet the needs of youth who um, have, have gotten involved in, uh, in the juvenile justice system or who have been offending. Um, MST uh, tends to have a, a rule that uh, other intensive supports, such as wraparound care coordination, needs to fade out while MST is being provided. How do we account for those kinds of rules in systems of care and wraparound? Costs of EBP certainly are often a challenge. Uh, in the early, earlier years of systems of care, when we weren't quite as good at figuring out how to integrate EBPs with systems of care, it was found that sometimes it was difficult to find enough resource in a system budget um, to fund uh, care coordinators, family and youth peer support providers, as well as uh, training on evidence-based practices for clinicians. So there are real barriers to integration, not the least of which are some of those misconceptions that Sue uh, re reviewed um, and ad attitudinal barriers. Next slide, please. But let's, let's get down to brass tacks. We are learning more and more how individual EBPs can be family and youth uh, directed and, and, and uh, allow for family youth uh, voice and choice, how evidence-based practices can be flexibly uh, implemented to meet a range of needs. So what we need to do at this point is to find ways to coordinate evidence-based practice with systems of care and for youth with uh, the most serious and complex needs, wraparound care coordination. And there are huge benefits to this. It is very possible to coordinate care and have it be individualized in a way that gives family and youth informed choice and allow them to choose, with help from a care coordinator, proven practices in the service array. Systems of care principles dictate the need for an array of effective service options, um, including evidence-based practices. Uh, so ensuring that there is both family and youth voice with informed choice uh, from an array of proven practices is really a critical uh, enterprise of our systems of care. Another benefit is to, uh, to try to ensure that our clinical providers in our systems of care can implement proven effective practices in a flexible, individualized, and family-directed manner, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, peer support workers and natural supports, we have found in our work integrating evidence-based practice with wraparound are particularly likely to benefit from knowing what the evidence-based treatments are that are being delivered so that they can provide follow-on support. A clinician may only meet with a family once or twice a week where a family or youth support worker might be with that family in their home for many hours a week, capable of helping them practice some of the skills that are uh, taught um, in an evidence-based treatment. So we found that uh, family and youth support workers are particularly interested in knowing what kinds of evidence-based practices are being delivered and be involved in support to implementing uh, those evidence-based practices. And finally, evidence shows that when you coordinate systems of care with evidence-based practice, when you provide wraparound along with evidence-based practices, it can improve youth outcomes very demonstrably. If you go to the next slide, um, what our colleagues in Hawaii learned uh, from a, a period of four or five years of simultaneously bringing up wraparound care coordination with modularized evidence-based practice approach, uh, this slide shows that when they first started on that uh, path, the uh, level of improvement, the, client, the degree of client change on the child and adolescent family assessment uh, scale that was uh, found was at about 0.4 points per month. By the end of their effort to uh, integrate wraparound and systems of care with evidence-based clinical care, they were finding that the, the slope of change was three times greater on that standardized outcome measure that they used in the system. So we were able to find, so, so our colleagues have been able to find that doing this kind of work thoughtfully in the system can communicate huge benefits to families that uh, can be observed system-wide. Next slide. So how do we achieve this? What are some system level options for coordinating evidence-based practice with uh, systems of care, within systems care, and with wraparound? Well, one thing uh, that can really be done is to make sure that you're always analyzing the match between your family and youth's needs 
and what kind of evidence-based practice are actually available. Um, conduct gaps analyses. Think about the array of evidence-based practices for very common types of child clinical disorders. Um, the biggest ones that we've found in our research that can cover 70 or 80 percent of youth needs are anxiety, depression, conduct problems, uh, and, and um, sequela of, the negative sequela of trauma. Having uh, EVPs that are available to uh, meet the needs of youth with those kinds of problem areas can really provide really uh, good coverage of the types of clinical needs that are going to be uh, reflected in your system of care. So then, uh, after having analyzed your availability, invest in intensive community-based evidence-based practices that can meet youth and family needs. Uh, Multisystemic therapy, again, a very skill-based uh, method, very comprehensive and intensive. Uh, therapists have uh, caseloads of four or five to one and work intensively with the youth and family to develop skills for ensuring that parents have the ability to monitor their, uh, their kids' activities, uh, reduce their association with delinquent peers, set better behavioral expectations. Um, and and the, the findings from MST are remarkable. Um, if you invest in, in a few of these evidence-based practices, you can actually go a long way. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the way this plays out. This slide, if you go ahead and animate it uh, once, John, if you invest in a single MST, as was found in Hawaii, a single EBP, such as multisystemic therapy, you are capable of meeting a third of the needs or the needs of a third of the youth who are, uh, who are demonstrating intensive needs in a system. Investing in two evidence-based practices, so perhaps MST plus trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, can have the capacity to meet uh, about half of uh, the needs of, of youth in the system. But what you'll see is, is that if you invest in as many, go ahead and keep animating John to the end. If you invested in eight, you would only get to about 69% of all the problem areas that are uh, reflected in a system of care for youth. And even if you invested in 100 EBPs, you'd only get it to 69%. So the first me me message here is to invest carefully in, in uh, a small number of evidence-based practices can really go a long way. Go to the next slide. What I want to show you now is uh, in a local community here in Washington State, um, both wraparound and multisystemic therapy um, is available, and they have an entire flow chart of decisions that um, take place when uh, a youth with intensive needs presents um, for services. Using the child and adolescent needs and, and strengths uh, scale as well as family information, eligibility for intensive services through the system of care is established. And a decision can be made about whether that youth is referred to multisystemic uh, therapy or wraparound, depending on the nature of their needs. About a quarter of the kids qualify for MST because they have uh, histories of conduct problems. Um, but those who have more complex needs or for whom MST is not a perfect fit, uh, wraparound is recommended where a care coordinator can work with uh, therapists as well as family partners to put together and, and natural supports to put together a comprehensive plan of care that's appropriate to that youth's needs. Um, next slide. Just a real quick point about the outcomes that have been found, the data we've collected in that uh, system. Um, go ahead and animate once, John. What you see here are uh, pre and post measures on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which is, which is a standardized emotional and behavioral functioning measure that's used in this community that has both wraparound and MST. And one thing you'll note is, again, uh, out of about 130 youth uh, that we have data for in that system, only about a quarter were eligible for MST or received MST. So MST is not a panacea. For the majority of youth, uh, a more individualized care planning process through wraparound was needed. Um, go to the next uh, animation. But what we did find is, is that the wraparound youth have substantially higher uh, overall emotional symptoms. Go to the next uh, animation. But the MST youth um, had very high conduct problem scores. And they showed much greater improvement in conduct problems than the wraparound youth did, which is reflective of MST's singular focus on reducing uh, conduct problems and juvenile delinquency in youth. But last slide, what we have was also found is, is that wraparound referred youth showed greater improvement in emotional symptoms. So again, this isn't an enterprise that's incumbent upon any system of care is to think about what kind of needs their youth have and what kinds of ways in which we can invest thoughtfully in a full array of supports 
um, that are going to be most likely to meet the diversity of youth and family needs. And EBPs can certainly play a role in that. Next slide. Okay, so a few options, other options for applying evidence-based practices for wraparound populations is to train the clinicians who are affiliated or allied with or who get referrals from wraparound teams um, in the system of care on relevant manualized EBPs. So train clinicians um, on things that have been found to be most effective and most likely to meet the majority of youth's needs, such as cognitive behavioral uh, interventions for anxiety, uh, depression, or trauma. Train them on uh, uh, ways to help parents better manage the behaviors of young kids with uh, oppositional and other big behaviors. You can also train clinicians on modularized evidence-based practices approaches that um, can flexibly meet the needs of youth and families that are engaged in wraparound teams. And I'll talk about that in a moment. You can train and supervise care coordinators to understand how best to access evidence-based practices that are in the service array, assuming that they exist, and how to build plans of care that include evidence-based practices. We, we want our care coordinators to both adhere to a wraparound model that is strengths and needs-oriented while also being able to make sure that evidence-based practices um, are, are looked to to meet needs whenever they are appropriate. And finally, we can train and supervise family and youth partners to understand how to be effective care extenders for evidence-based practice elements that are in plans of care. This is something that we are doing in a few communities here in Washington State. Um, next slide. So I'm running a little bit short on time, but just a couple more notes about ways to, in fact, train clinicians in a system of care to implement modularized, flexible, individualized evidence-based practices. We've been working with um, uh, PracticeWise Incorporated, uh, uh, Eric Delayden and Bruce Torpedo's group uh, that actually had the origins of their work in that Hawaii system of care that I showed that impressive data from. They have developed a system called PracticeWise Evidence-Based Services Database that allows a clinician to access information about what the research says are likely to be the best uh, approaches from the evidence for meeting a, a client's needs. And so using a web-based system, go to the next uh, slide, um, clinicians that we're training here in Washington State and a couple of other places to work with uh, wraparound teams, they're part of the wraparound team, they're understanding the youth and family's needs and strengths, but when called upon to provide treatment uh, within that wraparound plan, they are accessing this database and asking um, that they can enter uh, the youth's age, gender, and, uh, and type of problem, and it will, return, um, a, it will return results from the research base on where, what the evidence says is going to be most likely to meet those needs or address those uh, problems. So for instance, if you enter in an eight-year-old with disruptive behavior problems, um, the evidence-based uh, the, the, the website will return um, the practice elements, not the manualized evidence-based practice, but the practice elements that they should consider using in uh, the therapy that they deliver to that uh, youth and family. Next slide. But there's the system that Managing and Adapting Practice, or MAP, uh, provides goes even further than that. It also has uh, dedicated resources for then implementing uh, those um, practices, such as uh, practice guides, that are two pages long that can be used by the trained clinician to actually then implement those, um, those practices. And go to the next slide. So anyway, we are, you, and uh, so again, this is anatomy of the practice guide. It helps guide the therapist on the process of implementing uh, those practices that come back from the search. So uh, go ahead and skip forward there, John. The last thing that's really critical is regardless of what kind of uh, system you're using to implement evidence-based practices, um, it is critical. If there's one thing that we see is most likely to um, enhance the outcomes experienced by any client in human services, it's knowing what you are focusing on and measuring progress towards meeting that goal. And so managing and adapting practice trained clinicians use a clinical dashboard to monitor progress. This is obviously an out, a, a principle of wraparound being outcomes-based but it's something we need to consistently train our care coordinators and our clinicians on, um, whether they are the therapist on a wraparound team or the care coordinator themselves. 
John, in the interest of time, because we only have 15 minutes left, uh, I'm just going to make the final point that in our work uh, supporting wraparound staff to implement uh, EBPs flexibly using the managing and adapting practice method, we found that our facilitators are rating the usefulness of those kinds of tools almost as highly as therapists. So what we, our conclusion is, is that this is a, a really potentially great direction to go um, in, in terms of integrating evidence-based practice into wraparound content. Go ahead and skip forward to Rosalind's slides because I've run out of time. And what I would, you can stop right there. Um, so my concluding point about ways to integrate uh, evidence-based practice within wraparound and systems of care is, is that uh, picking one or two uh, ecologically focused intensive EBPs to have coexist um, in a wraparound system can be a really uh, effective method of getting better outcomes, as well as training our clinicians who are allied with uh, wraparound providers on flexible modularized evidence-based practices. But there are other options for wraparound providers, uh, one of which Rosalind is going to describe to us right now, which is incorporating elements of evidence-based models directly into wraparound care coordination. Thanks, Eric. Next slide. Uh, this is an example from a couple of years ago in Houston. It came out of a participatory evaluation that included family members, advisors, and supervisors who were not happy with fidelity and outcomes in wraparound. Populations served was more diverse, primarily African American Hispanic, than most systems of care sites, and the behaviors of concern uh, were also more severe, both emotional and behavioral. So we came up with these adjustments to various phases of wraparound. We integrated elements of solution-based casework, family group conferencing, or team decision making, and MST. Uh, we taught and then coached, and we actually changed, and you'll see examples of this, uh, the data forms and the use of the data forms in implement, implementing these changes. Um, we taught the facilitators and family partners to develop timelines with family members that identify changes in family composition in relationship to achievements or the emergence of behaviors of concern, and then to clarify that behavior of concern. We did the same around team composition and development, using that behavioral specificity uh, to generate more uh, specific goals for the child and family teams, and we taught how to develop guidelines for uh, team practice that had, uh, based on the relationships of those that were involved, um, how is information shared, what kinds of information get shared with whom, how are decisions made, and how are conflicts resolved in the team. Uh, I'll skip some of the other elements and, and concerns for time. The MST part was really significant. Uh, we brought in fit circle assessment in order to identify contributing factors to those family achievements in that timeline. And we wanted to use those to expand team composition, to get more natural supports on the team, as well as to have real functional strengths as the basis for our interventions. The uh, fit circle assessment also was focused on behaviors of concern. And we used this to develop much more specific step-by-step -step interventions rather than referring out to services. Next slide. Uh, here's an example of an achievement fit circle. Um, the middle is the achievement, and what's around it are interactions within the family, between family members and others, be they peers, be they the school, members of the community that the family felt contributed to the youth improving behavior and grades at school and not getting suspended. Direction of arrows indicates that the factor influences either the uh, achievement in the middle or perhaps uh, another factor. Next slide, please. So the basis of this is ecological systems theory. Um, we transferred those drawings, which by the way the families loved, uh, to a strengths assessment data form, organizing it by those five areas, youth, family, peer, school, community. This is directly out of MST. And this became something that was circulated um, 
from the facilitator to the supervisor, the consultant, and eventually the administrators. Next slide. Um, here's an example of what an MST would be called a problem fit circle. Uh, in the center, the family would have said, my kid needs to stay in school, not get suspended, and get better grades. And on the outside is uh, the factors that they felt, again, within the family or between family members and others that contributed to the suspensions and the poor academic performance. Key thing here is that what's outside that circle was the target for interventions. And we knew that if we diminished those contributing factors, eventually the behaviors in the circle would improve. Next slide, please. These were transferred to what we call the Constraints Assessment Data Form. And next slide, please. I'm trying to move fast, sorry. Um, the combination of those fit circles and the uh, an, an amalgamating those, those constraints or those strengths were used in the design of interventions. Left column is that center of the problem fit circle or need fit circle. The intervention itself would be targeting one of those contributing factors or at most two between team meetings. Strengths from the achievement fit circles would be used in designing a very specific intervention, who does what with whom, when and in what manner, trying to change what family members do with each other or between themselves in the school or the youth and the peers. And we had specific guidelines for how to learn from these interventions. Next slide, please. Uh, just for it, yeah. The key thing here, the slide, that's fine. Um, it, we, we constantly reviewed this between supervisors and uh, administrators and consultants to improve the coaching of the staff. And these were bachelor's level staff. Uh, here's the improvements over 12 to 18 months, better team composition, um, more robust assessments, uh, more complex multi-system interventions where something would be happening at school that complemented what was happening at home. Um, and contrary to what staff who had been trained repeatedly uh, in um, more traditional wraparound, um, families actually embraced this. Uh, next slides real quickly, and we'll pass through these. Apologies for moving fast. Um, here's some outcomes. Blue, blue line is before we did the change, uh, purple is after, and gray is national mean on the wraparound fidelity index. And at a quick glance, and you can review this later, uh, you'll see that we improved, next slide please, on each and every one of the indicators to above the national mean, and in some cases well above where the Houston site was previous. Next slide. And this is just a quick photograph of some of the school disciplinary action changes, national comparison versus systems of hope at intake and at six months, and you'll see both that it was a more challenging population to work with, and we made rather significant improvements. Sorry, that's all I can say in this short amount of time. Thank you, Rosalind. I'm going to hand it now to Tegan Henke. We have a real Texas theme here. Texas, you know, prides itself on big thinking. I think that what we're talking about here are a lot of big ideas. So thus far, we've talked a lot about the practice and organizational and system level things we can do to integrate evidence-based practices within systems of care. Tegan's now going to talk about ways in which this has happened at a state level. Go ahead, Tegan. All right. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I'll try to give everyone a quick overview of what Texas has embarked upon in integrating and um, implementing evidence-based practices throughout our local and state systems. So in about 2010-ish, the uh, public mental health system it began the process of redesigning the children's mental health service delivery system. So they partnered with providers and the advocacy community to evaluate the system. And now there were a lot of areas that, um, that the overall system change was going to address, but I'm just going to focus on evidence-based practices today. So um, to that end, evidence-based practices and fidelity to those evidence-based practices were really the foundation on which the state wanted to build um, its service delivery system. So wanted that to be a value throughout. The first thing uh, that they did, again, as I said, we partnered with providers and the advocacy community. Uh, we started doing a uh, literature review of evidence-based practices. 
And we had certain criteria that we were looking for, knowing that um, we wanted it to fit well within our system and what our, our providers and our families and, and the children in our service delivery system needed. So our criteria was that, you know, for one, it had to be appropriate and effective, of course, for the population that we saw. So, you know, broadly it had to address issues around um, behavioral needs, acting out depression, anxiety, attention deficit disorders, um, you know, just some of the broad needs that we see across our system. Um, they also had to be able to be delivered by bachelor's level staff. Uh, we have a workforce shortage in Texas, so it's really important for us to be able to maximize the use of bachelor's level staff whenever possible and reserve our licensed staff for things like counseling, diagnosis. So in selecting a skills training or rehab curriculum, um, being able to be delivered by bachelor's level staff was really important to us. And of course, affordable. Um, we needed some practices that the system could sustain. Um, like, like most people, I think, would probably say about their state system, um, Texas is always saying that we are underfunded. So um, anything that we, had to, that we were going to implement was going to have to be affordable and sustainable, both locally and um, through the state's investments. Um, so the evidence-based and promising practices that were selected by the state, again, you know, based on the criteria that I outlined, are listed on the PowerPoint you can see. Um, now, I just want to say that affordability was really, I think, underpinning everything that we did. So if we could have sustained something like Triple P, I think we would have jumped at the chance. Um, but we really were looking at um, the, the cost of ramping up and being able to train our, our system in a variety of skill training and counseling protocols and um, you know, getting everything out there. So really the state elected to invest the most resources in, into supporting high fidelity or what, what we're calling high quality wraparound for those youth with the most intense needs. Um, the attention was really for those wraparound teams to select the most appropriate evidence-based practice based on the presenting need. Now, Texas selected the CANS, or the Child and, Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths Assessment, as their statewide mental health assessment. So um, really what they, what they also did in implementing all of these practices was to provide guidance to a lot of the clinicians in how to select an evidence-based practice based on those needs and strengths of, um, that were identified in the CANS. So for example, if the assessment showed elevated scores on the items of anger control, conduct, delinquency, um, they might want to consider using aggression replacement training. Or if there are elevated scores in depression and anxiety um, and trauma, they might want to consider CBT or trauma-focused CBT. And so the idea is really simplistic, but um, you know, simplistic example, but the state really envisioned a collaborative process among those members of the wraparound team in selecting of the available interventions um, with the, the children and families. Um, so wraparound is available in the most intensive level of care um, within the uh, service delivery system, but we also have the Youth Empowerment Services Waiver, which is a 1915C waiver. And um, the, that Medicaid program has also um, endorsed wraparound or requires providers to use wraparound um, as their form of intensive case management, which I'll talk about in just a minute here. Um, and so under the YES waiver, there is a little bit more flexibility in selecting interventions. So the team can, can see if there are other, other interventions available, you know, like Triple P, for example, in specific communities. And they'll have more flexibility in selecting um, an appropriate evidence-based practice based on that youth's needs. You can go to the next slide. So the process for embedding the evidence-based practices into the infrastructure, you can see it's a little, uh, little overwhelmed face. Um, which is how we felt, I think, quite a bit. Uh, the state of Texas took a few different approaches to embedding evidence-based practices into an overall state-right-wide system. So the first thing that we did was require the use of evidence-based practices in administrative code or statute. Um, we had to be careful in the language that we were using because statute is difficult to change and it's reviewed only every couple of years. So we wanted to allow for some evolution um, of evidence-based practices and, and the department approved evidence-based practices uh, within, in, within statute. So it's pretty vague in statute, um, but we tied intensive case management to wraparound. So basically in statute it says that providers who are delivering intensive case management must use the department approved model of wraparound. 
and the department further specified that the NWI model of wraparound is the, the model that's endorsed. So what that effectively did was say that providers could really only bill for intensive case management if they're doing wraparound. And similarly, for the skill training cur curriculums that were um, selected, they also said in statute you must use the department-approved evidence-based practice for skill training. And now, as you can see, there were a number of different um, a number of different skill training protocols that they could select from, and similar to counseling. So CBT is the department-approved, and trauma-focused CBT and PCIT are also allowed. Um, we then went a step further and required, um, put specific training requirements for, um, for clinicians who are delivering it, so our bachelor's level staff or whoever is delivering these evidence-based practices, um, put requirements in contract around training and supervisor requirements for each EBP. So one thing that I want to note related to CBT is that the state moved from a training requirement, which providers uh, found to be very costly in training all of their providers in CBT, to a competency requirement in which the CBT providers were required to submit tapes to one of the nationally recognized organizations um, to review those for fidelity and competence. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the lessons learned um, later, but this is you know, the state's attempt to really um, meet the provider's needs and, and what can they what can they train their staff in, in you know, cost-effective ways, and, and you know, really trying to form a partnership with those providers in effectively providing the different evidence-based practices. So beyond the requirements in statute and contract, the state took, another, took a few more efforts to support implementation. And one of the most useful things that they did was to develop a PowerPoint that aligned the activities of wraparound with the activities of intensive case management that was outlined in statute and the Medicaid state plan. So what that effectively did was help providers to understand what was billable and what wasn't, and in the end it helped them to maximize their billing opportunities. Um, the state really didn't want wraparound um, to fail, and you can't see what I'm doing here, but I'm, I'm using air quotes. Um, we didn't want it to fail because it was too expensive, because the state really believed in wraparound and believed it could be used within the model of the service delivery system, and was um, a great way of getting evidence-based practices um, to, to kids and families. Um, the other thing that the state did was dedicate some funds to support a training infrastructure, which basically coordinates the logistics of some of the, uh, the, some of the trainings in, those, in some of those EVPs and keeps a pulse on when specific trainings are needed in certain regions throughout the state, and then offers it to providers at a, at a reduced rate. And at this time for wraparound, um, the Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, where I'm located now, is supporting wraparound, and the state has invested a lot of money in supporting wraparound, um, or the impl implementation of wraparound throughout the state, um, and it has invested in coaching and organizational support. Hang on to the next slide. And in the interest of time, I'm going to be very concise here, but now that things have slowed down, the state is starting to look a little bit beyond implementation. Um, and so at the state level, I think you know, everybody is looking at fidelity and, and recognizing, you know, now how do we, how, we knew there would be some ramp up time, but how do we get these evidence-based practices implemented to fidelity? And when do we measure that? When can we reasonably expect our providers to, um, to be able to be operating at maximum fidelity. Um, and then, you know, also recognizing the need for coaching. I think that's happening on the organization level as well as um, the state level, you know, needing to support coaching. So um, the state has, has um, done some peer-to-peer -peer conference calls um, to try to support implementation on the local level. Um, the one last thing that I'll say um, related to competency and CBT um, that you know, submitting the tapes and, and trying to achieve competency through a fidelity review on tape has been a challenge for the staff um, for CBT. So our licensed staff are really, for the most part, struggling to meet those CBT requirements. And I don't think that's because we have less than stellar counseling staff. I think that we have some really dedicated and great counselors in Texas. Um, but I think it, help, it highlights the challenges in being able to accurately implement a practice after a training. And um, it really supports what implementation science tells us about the value of coaching and support. And I don't think this is unique to Texas either. Um, you know, I think just training throughout the country in um, counseling or, or any of the other disciplines does not 
does not teach a lot of um, evidence-based practices, so people aren't entering the field with that skill set, and we need to remember that we have to sort of build that among our workforce. Um, so in the interest of time, I think I've gone over all, already, but um, you know, for Texas, the big, the big thing that we walk away with is you know, change is hard, but system change is harder. And I think we've got some really dedicated folks here who, are, who buy into evidence-based practices and really, you know, like you said, want to make things bigger and better. So um, we're, we're, we're working hard to make it happen. Thank you, Tegan. And it's, it's great to have you kind of conclude about the system level piece of this. Um, there's a kind of old maxim from implementation science that goes as follows that says that systems trump programs. So no matter how uh, amazing the evidence is for a specific uh, strategy or treatment, if a system is incapable of supporting it through uh, financial support, reimbursement, training for providers, or triaging kids to those and, and getting the right kids referred to those providers who are trained on EBPs, um, we're not going to see those positive effects like we, was found in Hawaii, which took a very systematic approach at the state level. I think Texas is another uh, great example of a state that's tried to, to bite off this very difficult issue. So I thank you for um, providing that perspective. So we are... Um, out of time for our uh, didactic part, but we are going to stay on and answer questions, um, which will also be recorded. Really quickly, the summary of the main points here is, is that it's just critically important that we use effective and cost-effective strategies and thoughtfully integrate them into our systems of care. We've seen the kinds of positive outcomes that can be achieved in states, uh, both anecdotally and with a couple of actual quantitative studies of, about what we can achieve when we do that well. So although there are challenges, evidence-based practice can be thoughtfully integrated into family and youth-driven individualized systems of care. Um, and there are system, provider, and youth, family, and team level strategies that we can try to infuse into our systems uh, to make it happen. Um, I'm looking at questions. I think the first one that's easy to, to ask since Tegan is still uh, fresh in our minds is uh, we have a question from the field or from the attendees that asks, can you uh, describe the model of wraparound that your department uses as one of its array of evidence-based practices? Yeah, so the state has endorsed the National Wraparound Initiative's model of wraparound. So we're working, you know, we've we talked a lot. We brought Eric down here a, a time or two. And, um, and are working closely with the TA network, actually, as well. Um, to, to implement the NWI model. So that's the specific one that we, that we endorse in Texas. Right, and it's worth, it's worth mentioning that uh, it's the uh, Institute for Implementation and Innovation at the University of Maryland Thank that, you. Is, that uh, is part of the National Wraparound Implementation Center that is training and coaching your providers. It's been an amazing success story uh, yeah. in terms of where Texas was three years ago and where it is now. Yeah, it's been really great, and I guess one of the other things worth mentioning too is, you know, working with um, the folks in Maryland is that we um, are really trying to build up in Texas a lot of coaches that we so that we can eventually be sustained within Texas and being able to to train our providers and and go out and coach our providers um, within the state of Texas. So we like to be able to do stuff on our own too. John, what are other questions from the attendees? <clears throat> yeah, I've been sort of watching, and I have uh, a summary of some of them. <clears throat> Very quickly, uh, I have gotten a couple requests for getting references to some of the studies that Sue had uh, mentioned, and I'm thinking that if it's okay, maybe we can just include those along as a, a PDF attachment along with our slides when we put it up on the NWI website. Uh, we can kind of take care of that afterward. Absolutely. I'd be happy to provide that. Great, thank you. So I'll make sure that that goes up there. So folks that need references, we've got them for you. <laughs> uh, the other questions, really, uh, there's a, a slew of them that came in around barriers, especially financial ones. Uh, can we address, like, what are ways to um, address the barriers of, you know, the cost of training uh, for wraparound programs and the licensing, I mean, training of EVPs and the licensing of EVPs and especially um, about Medicaid funding. And we had one in particular um, regarding that, uh, basically how, how you get Medicaid funding to cover 
uh, certain aspects of uh, the practice. So I would I would defer to Sue Kearns, who's actually actively studying that question as it's being grappled with by providers. Um, <laughs> well, the important uh, part of the sentence that you said is actively investigating. So the sad part of that is that there aren't any clear answers yet. Um, but I can, I can tell you briefly about a project that I'm working on that will be forthcoming. We have a group of providers where we're really looking at what are the, what are the true, we call it the true cost, although the economist I'm working with says you can't really call it true because there's no way to capture everything. But really trying to get a more accurate picture of what it costs to implement evidence-based practices and what sort of the incremental costs. So, what are any additional costs above and beyond, the, you know, kind of your treatment as usual? And trying to articulate that in a really thoughtful way so that as agencies go forward in um, adopting new practices, they have um, a framework. And we're trying to base this work on um, implementation science work that's been done and recognizing that agencies and organizations go through a process of implementation that doesn't start the day that they get trained. And I think a lot of the information that's out there is, you know, this is the cost for training and they can kind of wrap their heads around that piece of it. But there's a lot of thoughtful planning and infrastructure building and supports that should predate the tr actual training. And anytime you are diverting staff resources to address those types of concerns, there's costs associated with that. So the purpose of that work is just to really start to get a closer handle on, on in real world settings with agencies that seem to be doing a pretty good job with implementing EVPs. What did, what did that look like for them? What, what were those costs in a naturalistic way? Um, so that should be actually forthcoming this summer. And we're hoping to have all the data collected by the end of this month at the latest. And, um, yeah, I would say that the sad thing is that uh, there's no clear answers on how to get the primary method through which services are paid, such as Medicaid or insurance, uh, to also cover some of those ancillary costs of providing uh, treatments that are uh, using a specific evidence-based model, such as the staff time that's required, pulling staff offline to participate in training, or paying the trainers to actually deliver that training are, are a couple of the biggest ones. Um, I, I do think that the states and sites and organizations that have successfully dealt with that have done whatever they can to find resources in the system to invest in uh, those kinds of ancillary costs that aren't necessarily covered by a Medicaid uh, reimbursement structure because they have seen that the savings to the state or the system in the long run is greater when you're providing something that's effective. So finding sources of flexible dollars, whether they're block grant dollars or uh, sales treatment sales tax dollars, as is the case, you know, fortunately here in Washington State for some of our jurisdictions, other kinds of, um, uh, of, of um, indirect costs that providers or systems are able to capture and reinvest. Um, you know, general fund dollars from states, uh, finding ways to actually apply those to the provision of effective treatments is, uh, it, it's always a, a local, um, you know, piece of creativity that has to take place. But there is unfortunately no real pat answers. Tegan, do you have any thoughts from Texas about ways in which Texas is found to actually find the resources to invest in training, coaching, supervision? Yeah, well, you know, unfortunately, I feel like we really scrape together a lot of things. Um, one of the one of the strategies that I know the state was encouraging among, among its providers was that they really band together, and so as much as possible, um, you know, the, coordinating these regional trainings. So, like I said, they're offered to our providers at a reduced rate, um, but that is in part because you know we're tracking that. So, um, kind of redirecting some dollars to an entity that will organize those trainings, and then. Um, it made it a lot more accessible for our providers. Um, they had to pull people away less for travel and things like that because we were able to do a more regionally based model. Um, but I think that the thing that was most useful was, uh, as I mentioned, um, that PowerPoint that we developed for our providers that really lined up um, specific activities that they were you know, required to do to do, fel to do wraparound to fidelity and aligned that with specific Medicaid billing criteria for intensive case management. 
And that is available to, um, you know, they, the state has that posted and we can make that available if folks want to check it out. Um, but that was really, really useful for our providers. Yeah, I think pulling together some of those other resources from Texas might be also um, important to include on the NWI website along with the PowerPoint so folks can get a hold of that if you're willing to share. Absolutely. Other questions, John? Yeah, um, kind of building off of that, um, basically, what about Medicaid payments for professional wraparound team members if wraparound is considered intensive case management? And along with that, is wraparound considered an EVP unto itself? So those are two questions. I'll start with the second <laughs> one. There are now uh, 10 controlled published studies of wraparound, which the review of which is uh, tends to uh, be viewed now as uh, meeting cri most typical criteria for evidence-based practices when seven or eight of the 10 sh clearly show uh, superior effects on things like out-of-home placement, uh, functioning, juvenile justice recidivism, uh, when kids receive wraparound versus no coordination of services. Um, we, we've seen that consistent effect, and right now the um, SAMHSA National Registry of Effective Practices and Programs, or NREP, is reviewing that portfolio of studies to determine the strength of evidence that exists for wraparound. But wraparound has been listed on the very influential Washington um, Institute for Public Policy as a research-based practice. It's listed in the California Clearinghouse for Child Welfare Practices um, as having a level of evidence. And like I said, I think that the research base is strong enough now that by most standards it does reach a level of evidence for uh, being more effective than um, not coordinating care or providing no such services. So I do think it is more and more being viewed as an evidence-based process, if not evidence-based practice. It's an evidence-based strategy. Uh, the first question about then how to get it paid for, you know, increasingly states are finding ways to blend funding streams for their kids across child-serving systems that have the most serious and complex needs. Medicaid, there are Medicaid strategies, and you can go to the National Wraparound Initiative or the Center for Health, um, the uh, CHCS website, one of the other core partners of the TA network, to find uh, if you Google CHCS, Medicaid, and wraparound, you're going to find some briefings about ways to use Medicaid to pay for things like family and youth support, wraparound care coordination, the participation of individual team members using Medicaid. But I think that it's important to recognize that a couple of the biggest um, system level methods of getting uh, full wraparound teamwork paid for is to use a care management entity approach that blends funding from multiple systems into a single pool um, or, or a braided um, source of funds that provides a case rate for a, a care management entity to actually coordinate the care of, uh, of these youth with the most complex needs um, using a wraparound care management uh, or care coordination strategy. Um, so there's an increasing number of states that have found ways to uh, develop that. Certainly wraparound Milwaukee is the longest um, uh, the, the longest standing example of using a care management entity approach to, to uh, braiding or blending funds into one pool that provides a case rate to wraparound care coordination that can flexibly pay for all the different professionals that work on the team. So I encourage you to go again to the National Wraparound Initiative website and there are webinars hosted by folks like Bruce Kamrat from Wraparound Milwaukee that talk about financing strategies for wraparound that can get the care coordination as well as EBPs and other uh, necessary supports paid for. I think that Medicaid waivers that are being obtained by states are also uh, a, a, a very promising mechanism for getting that done. Uh, Tegan mentioned a couple of ways in which Texas is trying to apply uh, Medicaid waiver dollars to their strategies. But again, there's more information out there on that question. Yeah. I'm also looking at the time and I'm looking at all the questions we have and I think many of them are going to be addressed by the additional resources that we're going to have on the NWI site 
along with this uh, presentation. But maybe we could take one last one, um, and I'll just I'll leave it up to Eric and others to chime in. Uh, do you feel there is a certain level of wraparound practice fidelity that needs to be demonstrated first before an organization or team is likely to have success effectively integrating a selected EVP? And how mutually exclusive are the two fidelity requirements, the wraparound and the selected EVP? Well, I don't think that there is any research, this is Eric, that, that demonstrates um, uh, or, or indicates that there's some level of wraparound fidelity that's necessary for the kids to benefit from an evidence-based practice that might be included in their plan of care. I think that there are two um, complementary strategies that both should be pursued in any system of care. Um, and I think that uh, even if a wraparound workforce, like the care coordinators, are not yet trained to uh, full certification on you know, some sort of formal wraparound model, that if a youth's level of need um, or type of need or, or um, treatment target would benefit from an evidence-based practice, that connecting that youth to that evidence-based practice um, would be critical to achieve. Now, that is one of the pieces of fidelity um, to wraparound, is being able to um, direct a, a, a needs-driven uh, process for the young person and their family. So an effective wraparound facilitator will, in fact, know about the resources that are available and how to link the kids' needs to those resources, providers, and supports in the community. So they're, again, complementary, but I don't think that there's anything that suggests that you have to have full fidelity wraparound before you have, uh, before it's worth investing in EVPs. Quite to the contrary, I think that, um, you know, for the kids for whom a specific EVP uh, would help them, it's incumbent that we get them that EVP in a way that is, in fact, in line with the family and youth's preferences, of course, which is another piece of fidelity to wrap around. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I, I don't think there's anything that suggests that one um, precludes the other or one has to precede the other. Okay. I see one other question that talks about triaging uh, EBPs. You know, so I would go so far as to say that even in the absence of wraparound care coordination, because wraparound is only intended for the kids, you know, at the tip of the pyramid with the most serious and complex needs. Those are the ones in which we want to invest in this extra resource of having care coordinators. Um, so the entire system and all of the, core, the key partners who may be referring to services should have uh, an awareness, including care coordinators, but also uh, juvenile justice prob probation uh, officers, uh, child welfare caseworkers, um, all of these folks who are in a role of um, referring the kids on their um, on their watch to appropriate services, um, it's really important that we educate them about what those services are, what those evidence-based practices are, for which needs they are appropriate, and how to ensure that the kids that they're uh, responsible for get connected to those uh, services when they are available in the system. So I think that there, you know, there are ways in which um, systems have developed guidance documents, including here in Washington State, we developed an entire guidance tool for uh, uh, child welfare caseworkers to help them select the appropriate EVP. So it's not just about wraparound. Systems of care have a lot of people who are involved in coordinating the care of young people. Even if formal wraparound is not available, we need to be educating our, our caseworkers, our probation officers, our mental health uh, providers, our supervisors of mental health uh, providers on how best to look at the needs of the youth and hook them up with an appropriate evidence-based treatment if it would um, be likely to benefit that kid. Great, and I think the rest of the questions will probably be best addressed by the additional resources that we have and the recording that we're going to be putting up on the NWI website. And I also just kind of wanted to give a plug for, for NWIC, the National Wraparound Implementation Center, as a uh, place that you can go to learn more about uh, the coaching and supervision model uh, for, for wraparound. And that website is nwic.org. That's right. Okay. 
And with that, I think we can close. Um, Eric, what do you think? I think we're done. And, and thanks very much to our panelists, Sue Kearns, Rosalind Bertram, and Tegan Henke. Uh, really appreciate you all joining with us today. And uh, feel free to uh, look for more resources on the NWI website, which has been totally revamped at uh, nwi.pdx.edu or just uh, uh, Google National Wraparound Initiative. Okay. And thanks, everyone. And we're signing off. Thanks, John. <laughs>